Hello Bellarmine Knights, welcome to Homecoming at Home, a week-long celebration connecting our alumni and friends back to Bellarmine, all from the comfort of your home. While we'll miss seeing you on campus this year for Homecoming, join us for a great listing of virtual events, including our first ever virtual silent auction. Due to the pandemic, the Bellarmine University Alumni Board of Directors and Women's Council have teamed to sponsor this virtual auction in support of our incredible students. Bellarmine's silent auction is happening now and in Saturday, February 6 at 8 o'clock p.m. Please visit the link listed to create your account and have some fun bidding on a wide variety of baskets, vacations, bourbon, and more. Thank you for your continued support of Bellarmine University and our students. Go Knights! Hello, I'm Scott Wiegand, Director of Athletics, and it's my pleasure to be with you and present this segment of Breakfast with Bob. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Bellarmine sports history from one of our legends here, Bob Fodd, who has uh, worn many hats at Bellarmine, whether that be a baseball cap, uh, the, the public address announcer for our, our basketball games, uh, a father, uh, a grand, grandfather, and uh, a professor. So I'm anxious to uh, tell you some stories uh, about Bob, with Bob, about Bellarmine. And uh, last time we were together, Bob, out on the baseball field, uh, we both threw out a ceremonial first pitch. That's correct. Uh, both of us threw to our collegiate catchers. That's correct. Right? You to Dr. Noonan, right, and uh, me to one of my catchers, Mike Malone, right, which was uh, quite a thrill uh, for us, you know, before a, right. a, an alumni game. Um, there's so many things. I mean, if we go down the the list, your game table staff, you're calling games, you're working with people like Sister Pat Loman, with John O'Regan, uh, with Al Burke, with Kalen Ryback. I mean, what was that like? That, that game table crew is pretty phenomenal. It, it was really my office. That was the interesting <laughs> part because uh, at that time, uh, I was the public address announcer for 27 years, and uh, Al Burke, who was the director of admissions underneath me, uh, basically ran the, uh, he was the timer. Nanette Schumann, who really was the first sports information director, right. was the registrar, and she was doing that job, but she was the 30-second sh uh, shot kept that particular clock running. And um, Sister Pat, the faculty member who has won the Teacher of the Year more than any other faculty member in the history of Bellarmine, uh, she was the uh, scorekeeper for the women's games and John O'Regan was the scorekeeper for the men's game and he did it for 33 years from the day he graduated in 1954 until he retired. And uh, that was amazing. Uh, he was a very dedicated person. Sister Pat was going to get it. But we did it, and none of us ever charged Bellarmine a dime. We did it basically pro bono. We did it for the school. We loved it. And we loved being in Knights Hall. Knights Hall was exciting. It was a thrill in there. And we did both men and women's games. We really enjoyed that. I think that was a very interesting. The only time I ever had a nervous breakdown almost <laughs> was when the uh, Kalen Ryback was late getting there, and the color guard was out there and I had to sing the national anthem and sister Pat went one way Al Burke went the other way and they left me with I had the microphone and I had to sing it and, that, that was one of the and, bad parts about always having the microphone right always having the microphone I told Jim Spaulding from that time on you better have a recording here <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's but the classic. students seemed to enjoy it it was very yeah. interesting well you talk about some of those names and you know I, I went here undergrad and my, my uh, got my master's as well and you know playing ball here and you know, Sister Pat, you know, let, let's just say she may or may not have helped me get through Western Civ uh, as I took that as an undergrad. Uh, but you, you talked a little bit about Knights Hall and, and tell us a little bit about when Knights Hall was built. Oh, yeah. What, what was the feeling on campus? Uh, then maybe leading up to what the first game was. Right. In Knights Hall, um, actually, I came here my sophomore year because I was in the seminary my first year in college. And everybody was so excited because Knights Hall was going to open up on December the 6th and uh, <clears throat> in the, the 1960. <laughs> and the first game was going to be against the University of Louisville. Peck Hickman, the coach at that time, who was an outstanding gentleman, and Alex Groza had agreed to play the game here, standing room only crowd. And um, 
the uh, everybody on this campus, I don't think every, there was hardly anyone who wasn't there. I mean, we right. wanted to be right. there, and this was something because the, for the basically 10 years, we had played uh, basketball in St. George's Gym. This was an all-male school at that time. And we played there at Mac and Gym. We played in different places along the way. We didn't have a gym to even practice in. We had nothing. And uh, that was something that was fantastic. But I think one of the more interesting things about that game is, yes, University of Louisville beat us. But Jack McLemore made the first basket ever in Knights Hall here <laughs> that particular night. So it wasn't a U of L player who, player who actually uh, put the first uh, ball through the hoops up here. It was actually Jack McLemore. I mean, and what a story. And, you know, the uh, the history here in, in Knights Hall, whether it be on the men's side or women's side with basketball, or even our, our tremendous volleyball program as well. Uh, but in use by all of our teams oh, yes. as it went through. I, re I think I've touched every step uh, multiple times, oh, whether yeah. it be conditioning for, for baseball or the, the number of times we uh, ran up and down. But, but you talk about Knights Hall, right? So we weren't always the Knights. No. So no, we tell really us about weren't. That. That's the funny the, the thing about it. When the school started in 1950 with all males, uh, the very first game, there were no scholarships, athletic scholarships. Students volunteered to come and play basketball, and the first game was against St. Mary's Seminary, of which most of the players at that time ended up being Catholic priests in the archdiocese, and they beat us. Uh, and uh, they didn't know what to call us, so they called themselves the Pioneers because that's what the first graduating class at Bellarmine in 1954 have always called themselves, even to this day, they still call themselves the Pioneers. So they were the Pioneers for one game, and after the uh, GAD game was on December 28th, and in January, Monsignor Harrigan, the founding president, decided that it was going to be the Knights, and the colors would be scarlet and silver, which we still have today. We well, talked about the, the Knights, but there was also another name, maybe for a freshman oh, basketball yes. team. That, that goes back to the fact that when we started here, um, the, we were, at that time, there was a college division and the university division in the... Uh, in the NCAA, and we weren't even in that yet. We were in the NAIA, and we were basically belonged to a conference called the uh, KIAC. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that particular time, freshmen in the NAIA could play. And we did that for up until 1962, when Alex Groza, who was then the coach, got us to get joint uh, double dual membership with both the NCAA and the NAIA. Um, the only problem was when you went to the NCAA, freshmen were not eligible at that time. So we had to create a freshman team, which we called the Squires. And uh, the Squires were in existence from 1962 until 1973, and uh, when basketball was allowed, freshmen were first allowed to play. So, so Bob, you've seen it all, the, the growth from, from Pioneers to, to Knights with the Squires. Uh, maturing into tonight's and fighting those battles on the, the courts and fields. Uh, but from my seat, you know, how fortunate we have been, you know, we stand on the shoulders that have come before us. Oh, yes. And, and you know, get into some of those stories about Coach Groza and Coach, Coach Rival and, and Coach, Coach Spalding. Oh, um, you, you go back, you have to go back in, all the way back into the beginning here. Um, most people are not aware that the first African-American to ever play college basketball in the state of Kentucky was a Bellarmine student in the very first class, 1950 and 51. He was not recruited. His name was Ted Wade. Mm -hmm. And he said, it wasn't a big deal. I just wanted to play ball. And uh, thus, Bellarmine has the reputation and the record of being the first university basically in the state of Kentucky to have an African-American play on their basketball team. So we have that record that is, and it started in the very beginning because Monsignor Hargan was very, very much into it. And we did this long before, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, which took place in 1954. Mm -hmm. So, which with integrating schools. And uh, so Bellarmine was integrated before even the Catholic high schools here in Louisville. And uh, so that's something that I think Bellarmine's been very proud of that we've always had that rep and reputation. And we had some great, great athletes that came here, like uh, Rudy Montgomery, Al Stevenson, who were African-Americans from Central High School. We had such great players that came here, like Jim Spaulding, our food athletic director, was the very first KIAC, all, you know, uh, all KIAC player. We had 
others that were that came through here like Joel Rabble, who eventually would become a coach and it was an outstanding player. But most people don't realize there's another player who never started a game in the 1950s. And his name is John McLeod. John McLeod never started a game in basketball. He played basketball. He played baseball also. He's much better baseball player as a center fielder for the Knights. But he went into coaching in high school basketball, started at the sales, ended up being the University of Oklahoma's coach, the University of Notre Dame's coach, and he eventually coached the Phoenix Suns and the New York Knicks. So when you really look back, there's a guy who basically was never a star here, who is still the most well-known athlete we've ever had in this school. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt about that. And it's John McLeod because of all his coaching experiences and the like. Well, it's pretty incredible. The names you mentioned, I'm obviously all athletic hall of famers and oh definitely and walk up and down you go out down this whole school there's plenty of them mm -hmm. and it's just amazing alex groza came here we gave him a second chance because of after if many people don't know who alex was he was the star at the university of kentucky on the fabulous five in 1948 then the, the team that won the national championship and then went into the olympics in 48 and the starting lineup of the university of kentucky was the starting team for our olympic champions, they never lost a game. Alex came here after being banned from the NBA for point shaving, which he always told anybody who ever played for him. And I played for Alex in baseball because in those days, you just didn't coach basketball. You, he, Alex coached baseball and, and uh, basketball. Jim Spaulding, his assistant, was assistant basketball, but he was also track and cross country coach, you know, and people had to do different, wear different hats. And I always enjoyed being there because he even told the baseball players the stories about what I did, and don't let you ever do that, because if you do, I won't, you won't get out of this room. <laughs> he would never allow any of us to even think about doing anything what he did. But he was such a good guy, I was a great guy, a great guy to play for. And uh, I think the fact that when he did leave here in 1966, um, when he died 25 some years later, um, we had a funeral mass here and all of the 1948 Olympic champions came, as well as just about every basketball and baseball player. Uh, he played for him, showed up mm -hmm. at that particular mass, and it was uh, that's how much people held him in great respect. Well, amazing but, story. Uh, he also brought the uh, first, we, uh, when this, this gym was three years old, Alex, uh, we got an invitation to host the NCAA tournament in 1963, which was his team, and also in 1965. In the 1965 story, Scott, there's the famous story of that particular NCAA tournament game. The students, a group of students, went out and took the statue of Bobby Bellerman that was in the hallway of Horrigan Hall and brought it into the locker room where the students were getting ready to play in the NCAA game. They brought the statue out, set it at midcourt there, and the players, when they came out, they all patted Bobby on the head, the statue, and did their warm-ups. And then the managers came and took it into the end zone here, put it into the stands, and immediately after the game started, they started yelling, Bobby is here. <laughs> and, you know, and that became a tremendous aspect of school spirit when this was an all-male institution, and they did that. But that was kind of an interesting story. Many people have never heard that before. But uh, it was certainly something that was a remarkable time. Well, when... The legend of Bobby B, oh. uh, even my time here in the late 80s as an undergrad, um, those stories and appearances may, may be in the student section. Wouldn't incriminate myself or any of my, my classmates, but I have sat close to Bobby B, let's just <laughs> say, on a few occasions, for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, if people had a great time, and it was something that was very enjoyable that uh, we, you know, looked at. Bellerman really had a uh, tremendous uh, uh, change, uh, and I'd say we, we really did. One thing I, would, I, was, I want to remember that is very important is, you know, our fight song is student or run. It was written and by a student in the 1950s, Frank Noop. And we're still singing that song today. And in 1975, St. Joe's of Philadelphia, a Division I school, came here to play us. And uh, at that time, the band could play the whole time during the game. And they never stopped. And he started, he gave them a name, called him that damn band. 
And then he said, they, you have the best fight song I have ever heard. Would you please send me the copy and the music? Because I want to take it to St. Joe's and show them <laughs> how good this, because this, you all beat us and uh, beat us in, in a game. And he says, I believe that band had a lot to do with it. And, uh, but that was an exciting time. So we, you know, we've, a lot of things we did are homegrown. Yeah, the school spirit, the school pride. You know, oh, yeah, it's, it's always been there. Always been there. It continues to grow. Knights Nation stronger than ever. Oh, yeah. But you talked a little bit about uh, Coach, and, you know, you play for, for Coach Grozen, but how about a story about Father John Dietrich out on the oh, baseball my. field? I heard that he may not have ever lost an argument with an umpire. No, he didn't. <laughs> uh, that was because he was a priest, <laughs> and he was the coach of our – you know, Bellarmine only had – two full-time employees here, and that was Jim Spaulding, who was the, uh, when I came here in 1976, but even before that, Jim Spaulding, the athletic director, and Joel Rival, the head basketball coach, and Libby King, the secretary, and that was it. That was the athletic department. Every other co sport we had, whether that was women's, um, whether it was golf or tennis or baseball or what, were all part-time people, and many of them were here, like Wendell Bowles, uh, an accounting professor, was a tennis coach. Father John was the campus minister, and he wanted to coach the baseball team and won two out of, he won two thirds of his games. But he never lost, as you said, with an umpire. And there was one time when we had a public school who came here to play Knights Hall, and a young man walked over to our dugout before the game while they were, both teams were warming up, and he said, uh, Coach, they tell me you're a Catholic priest. And he said, Yes, I am. He said, Well, uh, is it okay? I'd like to go to confession. <laughs> and so Father Dietrich took him all the way out to center field. The two of them walked out there. He heard his confession. He thanked Father Dietrich, came back, and they played the ball game. So those are interesting things that have happened uh, during, basket, during the baseball season, and he certainly was an outstanding thing. Uh, he had, I think Father Dietrich had f has five of his former players are in the Bellarmine Hall of Fame. He had an outstanding record. Uh, and he was the campus minister. But we all did that. Al Burke was the head baseball coach here. He was an outstanding player under Father Dietrich, but he was my dean of admissions. And I had Gene Weiss, who coached cross country and track, um, both men and women, and he was uh, an admissions counselor. He worked in the office here. Nanette Schumann, as I said earlier, was a registrar, and uh, she was a sports information director. And we did all kinds of things that were fun to do, and we enjoyed the athletic program. But people got along and really got into the spirit of Bellarmine and making Bellarmine what it is today. And I think that it, I still see that here in, mm -hmm. with us today in every way, shape, or form and well, all of them. That blue-collar work ethic oh, yes, is, definitely. is evident today. But it, it's more like a, a Bellarmine web. Once yes. you come, you get caught in it. You do. And the Bellarmine impact. Yeah. What, what happens with our students and why I think they're so successful um, is because of that experience. I think that's true. And it was also, in fact, one thing Jim Spaulding did, we had to, re, uh, you know, fundraise. There was no other doubt about it. People don't realize that in, from 1976 to, to uh, uh, actually 1992 for 16 years, we ran bingo every Friday night here in Knights Hall. We averaged over those 16 years, because I was, athletics reported to me most of that time, $250,000 a year off bingo. And, uh, you know, it was a fantastic way of raising funds. Who did it? The students set the bingo up. The students took it down. The athletic teams did this. And we saw that people who worked the bingo, they were parents. They were the boosters. We started a booster group that built this. And they were doing things that were fantastic. So we had people uh, who many of the parents were alumni. And uh, they graduated in the 50s and 60s. And here by the 80s, they were back here working and helping out with well, you yes. talk about bingo setup and breakdown. As a former baseball player, I am oh, all too familiar. You did that with, with that. That sponsored your trips to, <laughs> down, down south at <laughs> spring sure training did. for it a allowed week. us to play a little basketball uh, late night on every other Friday when we were here. But you know, as, as things progressed, and you know that yeoman's work and, and a lot of people pitching in to make things happen. Well, you know, with things started happening with the evolution of the merger. Right. Uh, for, oh, that for was both a major colleges. change. And, and what, what did that mean for athletics? What, what about the start of women's sports? Well, when the merger came in 1968, uh, it was a definite big change. Could you go from 
a all male institution. And then you had a name change. It was Bellarmine Dash Ursuline for two years. And uh, the only people who didn't recognize that were the Courier Journal Sports Department. They still called us Bellarmine College. They never did refer to us as Bellarmine Ursuline. Um, and in 1970, we went back to Bellarmine College and dropped the Ursuline. Um, and it worked out very well with our Ursuline graduates and, uh, and the like. But for four years, the women who were here on campus, they didn't have athletics. Athletics came about because of a major thing that happened in Congress called Title IX. And it's interesting because Title IX, when you read it, the word athletics is never mentioned in it. Right. It's basically uh, very much aware that athletics is gonna have to play an integral part, especially in the collegiate world, just as financial aid is. And as a result, we see that when we did that, we had to start a women's program. And Jim Spalding did a great job of doing that, getting it started as the athletic director. We started with women's basketball and women's volleyball. Uh, Sister Pat became our representative to what was called the KWIC, the Kentucky Women in Intercollegiate Conference, of which U of L and U of K were also members. <laughs> and right. they played volleyball and basketball against us because that was the conference. They, we, the KWIC belonged to the AIAW, which is they, it was, they were not a part of the NCAA until 1984. And the AIAW included everybody, small schools, big schools, anybody that had a women's program. And we started and eventually those sports grew slowly but surely until uh, you know, we reached the point today where we have equal number of men and women sports, 11 and 11, and uh, that's fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit more about the impact of when things started started going and, you know, another another nickname. Oh, yes, a big nickname. That was very much so. We were the only school that basically ever had two nicknames. Uh, the women's team, Jim Spaulding got this started. He wanted to call them something different than the Knights, and they were called the Bellman Bells, and the girls absolutely loved it, so, Sister Pat especially. And the Bellarmine Bells, it just rang well with the word, the first four letters of our name, the Bellarmine Bells, and it was just beautiful to deal with it. And the girls had bells across their uniforms, and, and whether that was in, uh, later on in softball or field hockey or whatnot, we had some great women, especially Lois Tarman, one of the greatest right. athletes we've ever had around here, who led our basketball team in the 70s in both uh, basketball, volleyball, and softball, and Dick Ewing, um, who is still in our Hall of Fame as a baseball pitcher. He's the only guy that ever pitched two no-hitters back-to-back. And he did that against Moorhead and Villa Madonna back in the 50s. And that's unbelievable, two no-hitters back-to-back. He ended up with a, a women's softball coach, and he called Lois the, the, the franchise. I thought that was probably the best way to describe her. But the women bells, they became very, very uh, affectionate uh, for most of the students. We didn't have a mascot at that time, a knight or a bell. We, and that was the main reason why Dr. McGowan in 1992 decided to change it. Originally, for four years, we were the Lady Knights, and then he became the Knights in 1996. <laughs> and um, it, it, there was a, you know, when a change came, it didn't come easily. It's like today's problems when you, between uh, our, our world of red and blue, or we're, or we're Democrats and Republicans. We were a lot of people, especially the older alumni, who resisted the fact that we went out and dropped the bells. Uh, right. They didn't particularly appreciate going to lady nights. And, uh, you know, eventually it's going to take time. Today, we the students don't even know anything about that. But those were great days. Well, before you uh, get back to telling us some more about the the powerhouse, the, the you know, de oh. definitely our women's basketball team oh, became... Lord. There, there was one my time here. Yeah, um, maybe not a a mascot per se that represented either the knights or right. the bells, but was tied to the BC comic strip. Yes. So how how did that happen? How did the grog become this affectionate, lovable round mound <laughs> that was jumping on the floor? Uh, I, that was something again that you know I really don't know the answer to because. Mm -hmm. Jim Spaulding was so proud of that, so I, he had something to do with it. It was here when I came in 1976, uh, because I graduated in 63, and then I came back here as a full-time employee in 1976 to work for Dr. Petrie. But it was already here, and I really don't know how it began, but it became an interesting thing. 
But you're right, we became a woman's basketball player under the tutelage of Charlie Just. I mean, and this man in his second year here took us to the Elite Eight. I mean, and this was in California. I went on that trip representing Dr. Petrick um, as the Vice President of Student Affairs. And uh, we took 12 girls and two managers, two coaches, Sister Pat and myself and Jim Spaulding. And the thing was, eight out of the 12 girls that we took that were on the basketball team had never been in an airplane before. And we're flying from here <laughs> to Los Angeles. And you talk about that was, a f they were scared to death. I mean, it really right. was. And we unfortunately did have some rocky weather to make it even worse. But uh, that was an experience. He did this and, and we went to, he went to four elite eights, a final four, and all of this thing, and all of a sudden, Bellarmine every year was ranked in the top 25 in women's basketball, mm -hmm. many times in the top 10. We went to the NCAA tournament uh, so many years, I think eight out of the 12 years he was here. Uh, it was just unbelievable. And uh, the, the, the fact that we did that, and even when he did leave, it continued uh, with Dave Smith and, and Chance Dugan. It's done very well. Mm -hmm. um, they've been to the NCAA tournament. They've stayed our women have done extremely well in the, over the years in Division Two, and it's been a joy to watch because I'll never forget the very first time we were out in Los Angeles, that very first time, we played Cal Poly Pomona in the quarterfinals on their home court. This team ended up number one in the country. They won the tournament and were undefeated. Nobody even beat them. Nope. University of Southern California played them that year, and Southern Cal was the ultimate national champion in Division I. They only lost one game, and that was to Cal Poly Pomona, which was a Division II school that won the national championship. But Stephanie Tracy was a freshman at that time, and she scored over 20 <laughs> points in that game. And after the game, I'll never forget, was standing very close to where Charlie was, and the coach of Cal Poly Pomona came over and said, Coach, that young lady, it's a freshman. I'd love to have her right now because I mark my word, she'll be an All-American next year. And she was an All-American for the next three years. <laughs> I mean, that was, she was an outstanding player and still our all-time leading scorer in right. women's basketball. Right. Yeah, Stephanie was a classmate. Mine was a treat to watch her play. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, be around her. A tremendous person, Hall of Famer. Uh, married to a Bellman basketball oh, yes. alum. Their oldest Brian daughter, Clemens. Morgan, uh, played for us, for us here. right. Uh, so the... the you know, Family just keeps going. Continue. So, right. you know, you talk about how um, how we succeeded on whether the men's side, the women's side, and now that we're a Division One institution, tell us a little bit about the first time you heard about Division One. I was just going to say the funny thing is I wrote this book right here for, with Father Cruz called In Veritatis Amore, and I finished writing through the 2018 season. And the book was going to be published and distributed in December of 2019, right before Christmas. And we were very proud of it, extremely proud of that whole thing. That was just unbelievable uh, because it was really um, pretty good history, a synopsis of what uh, Bellarmine Athletics was all about. And then three months later, we find out that we're going to Division I. So I look upon this part that I did here as a story of Division II <laughs> before Division I. But I have to say, you know, when you look at Bellarmine and we talk about Division I, you have to talk about Scott Davenport and what he has done here and all of the things that we've seen Bellarmine has done. This man, uh, since 2009, won 23 games every year. And all of the things, winning a national championship in 2011, under your tutelage as athletic director, when you became athletic director in 2005, Scott, you not only saw a national championship, you started the first Division I program here in lacrosse, uh, which has been with us, it's hard to believe, 15 years, going on its 16th <laughs> year. Uh, and then we've uh, realized that uh, during your time, you've seen Division I, you've added different sports like women's swimming and, and, uh, rest and men and women's swimming and wrestling. Uh, things that many years ago we would never have dreamed of ever getting into. And uh, it's interesting you, you say it that way because, you know, Bob, you, you know the history of this place better than any, but there's a picture in my office um, at, a, at a Hall of Fame, Athletics Hall of Fame induction, and I'm standing between Coach Spalding and David O'Toole. 
Oh, yeah. So, as you know, Coach Spalding was my athletics director. Right, yeah. And David O'Toole was the director of athletics that, that hired me to be right. the baseball coach some yes. 21 years ago now. And I've, I've said it publicly that Coach Spalding, you know, things were, were tight. We managed. Oh, yeah, we did. Um, he was the AD that said no. Yes. Uh, David O'Toole was the AD that got to say maybe, and that's allowed me to say yes on so <laughs> well, many that, occasions. That's a good idea. So, uh, you know, this, you, you mentioned Coach Davenport and, and how we ramped up uh, that men's program under his, his yeah. guidance. That started, um, you know, both Coach and I are from south end of town. So he's coaching at the University of Louisville. They're preparing for a run and deep in the, the NCAA tournament. We met at an O'Charlie's. And if you go back oh, yeah. to the Dixie Highway corridor, I remember that. there um, uh, people that have been that are Louisvillians remember Bacon's. Oh yes, the right store. next door. Yeah, so that's the parking nice lot we oh, were yeah. in, and we started uh, after practice about seven thirty. Um, we had not left the same table. Um, it's almost midnight. My wife's calling. Where are you? Is everything okay? <laughs> right. And I said, Danielle. I said we're just solving all the world's problems. Um, really the first person I talked to about the job. And, you know, we were, we were lucky enough to, to get coach. And um, once we named him, we had a press conference early morning, um, I want to say 6.30 or so, and he started individual instruction right after the press conference. And that was after the season. So guys were gearing up toward the end of the semester. But, I mean, the brand of basketball, oh. uh, the relentless pursuit of oh. excellence and everything they do, and that, that national championship in Springfield, I'll, I'll never forget wow. walking out of the press conference with Dr. McGowan, and I had you know, gotten the, the game ball from Coach and everybody on basketball staff and presented it to Dr. McGowan, and he's carrying it with him. And he's um, humming one of his favorite tunes that we all know, Sweet Caroline. Oh, yeah. And it was one of those deals that we were just, you know, your chest is full. Right. And... I would look at him, he would look at me, but neither one of us could really say anything. Right. You're just so excited, exhausted, oh, yeah. every emotion. I remember it so well. Oh. So that was that was fun. And, um, you know, the addition of, of sports and talk about the Division I uh, lacrosse program. So I've, I've gotten to see us in the Great Western Lacrosse League with the right. likes of Denver and Air Force and Notre Dame and right. the Ohio State University. And here we are. Bellarmine. Yeah, and we're on right. a lacrosse La island in Louisville, Kentucky. But that afforded us some opportunities to expand our recruiting oh, yes. reach, our brand reach, and reach into the Northeast in a game that's traditionally the hotbeds in Long Island and Baltimore area. Right. Um, that was a, a pretty uh, pretty bold initiative. Yes, it was. And and then to go to the ECAC and still be uh, pretty much the, the footprint up in the Northeast quadrant and now in the, the SOCON. Um, as the ever shifting landscape of Division One athletics has continued to evolve, uh, that ECAC I was the chair of the Division One men's lacrosse league for the ECAC when it disbanded. <laughs> so I, that is on, uh, I guess that's on my list uh, the, of accomplishments, good or bad. Uh, but at the same time, uh, to land in the SoCon, and that's always been about um, like-minded institutions and quality association, right? And and playing with the right. Um, the right group of institutions you, in which we fit and our values fit. So I, it's been quite a, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's been 20 plus years that well, I've been making that same drive, but but it has. Yes, it has. It's been doing very, very well, and it is. It's very much so. So the, uh, tell us, have, have you ever studied football here, Bob? Yeah, we did. We actually did at one time. In fact, uh, I was surprised when I was doing research for this book to realize that um, in 1951, it was strongly recommended that Bellarmine start football as its third sport. However, um, there was no money, and as a result, it died, and it never did get resurrected again. In 1985, Dr. Petrick looked at, asked me as the vice president of student affairs and since athletics reported to me to look into what it would take to go Division I basketball or start a football program. One of the, you know, one or the other, do both. What can we do? Do the best you can do. At that time, there was a league called the Great Midwest League in basketball that was involved Dayton, Xavier, Butler, Evansville, Valparaiso. And I really felt geographically that was perfect for us. Mm -hmm. 
Um, most of the schools didn't want to talk to me, but Dayton did. And the Dayton athletic director talked to me for a long time. He said, you know, I'm going to speak for everybody. I, I really am because we would love to be in Louisville, but you're too small. You're just, you're not there yet. Give us yourself another 10 years and then call me back. <laughs> says, we'd really like to talk about it. He said, but I looked into football and we talked about a lot of different things on how we could fundraise and get football. But football to start even in 1985 was going to be a $2 million project. And we didn't have a field house. We only had Knights Hall and we had to house all of our sports here. Right. Where were we going to put at least 60 football players in the fall when we basically had basketball would be starting? We had men and women's, uh, both women with basketball, volleyball going. And at that time we had soccer. Where are you going to put all these people? Um, and uh, we knew we had to build a field house. We would have to change a lot of things. We'd have to build a stadium. We'd have to play either at a high school field. And uh, Dr. Petrie finally said, we're going to not get into this. This is not for us. And uh, the guy at the University of Dayton, uh, one thing I asked him about in football, which is very interesting, because at that time they were a Division I school, but they were playing Division Three football with no scholarships. Yes. And he said the main reason we got into football was not to play football, but basically to make sure that our music department had enough students for a marching band. And he says, our marching band was so important to this university that football became a non-scholarship sport that went that way. Well, you talked a little bit about the facilities. And my tall, we've, we've had some, some great improvements here. Oh, there. God, tremendous. You know, Frazier Stadium, the Eddie Weber oh, yeah. Tennis Complex. Uh, our wrestling facility is as, as good as anything I've seen around, you know, from track and field to baseball, softball. Um, tell us your perception, not only as a Bellarmine person, but as a Bellarmine fan, the, the growth, not just of athletics, but, but Bellarmine as a whole. What, what's your experience been, the fan experience coming to games? I think that you, we've, we've seen a, a change. You know, back in the 70s, it was really a time before ESPN, before cable TV, most of our games here in Knights Hall were, and we had 3,400 seats at that time with the bleachers. And students came because they had nothing else to do. There wasn't anything on TV. Games like U of L and U of K were delayed until 11:30 at night, and so you never really had much to see. But what we basically saw that during this time was that once cable TV, and we had to start hustling to get fans in here. Uh, the students still came, but we still we were losing fans to the TV networks and the like. And I think that's one of the problems that's been facing a lot of college athletics mm -hmm. uh, over the years. But I think one of the things that always amazes me is the loyalty of the fans, people here that you see that get so enthusiastic about the games. And by the last uh, 10 to 12 years, I mean, in this particular, it, it's being in here on a basketball night was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I know we enjoy going out to Freedom Hall. It's going to be the thing with this pandemic we have to do, and it's going to be the way of the future, and it will grow. It will mm -hmm. take time. Mm -hmm. But the closeness in here was something that it's hard right. to compare against. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, and then the loyalty. Uh, we have carved our niche. Oh, yeah. With Mike's we have Nation, a tremendous and our, our fans, we have a tremendous following. We're, we're blessed to have that. And, and I, like you said, I, it's, we're on the right trajectory. Oh, I, yeah, I definitely. Think, so you, you mentioned Freedom Hall. Um, how about Bellarmine's first game at Freedom Hall? Now, Bellarmine, you know, Freedom Hall started in 1956. And uh, at that particular time, people can't believe that we played two games there. We played against uh, an exhibition game right after it started with an Army team from Fort Knox of former college players. And then we played, sorry, Dr. Donovan, we played the <laughs> Loyola University of Maryland team in a real game later that season in Freedom Hall and we beat your former school. <laughs> At that time, they were university division, we were college division, but they played each other. There was not a big problem because I, when I was a student here, we played Notre Dame, Xavier, Creighton, student, Steubenville, all of these type of schools that were division one big time schools mm -hmm. because when, before division one, two and three came in 1973, the university and college divisions played against one another and the only differences was the university divisions had their own tournament and the college divisions had their own tournament. 
And uh, that was pretty much it. College division was for smaller schools. University division was for larger schools. Right. Then division one, two, and three came, and then you had to pick and choose. Right. And we chose division two with scholarships rather than division three without it. And, and I'm, I'm thankful we did. I uh, am too. I had, uh, it was the best that, move. Had that opportunity to uh, come here and study oh, yeah. biology and at the same time play some really good baseball. Because oh, at that yeah. time, our schedule was probably 60% Division One. Right. We played oh, Louisville, yeah. Kentucky, IU, EKU, uh, Western, you name it. And we played everyone. And yeah, we, were we played everybody. And I think that's really, it was just amazing to, to see that. That's been the way, pretty much the way we... Uh, have had with our neighbors. I know when my youngest daughter played field hockey here, we played the University of Louisville three times every year, you know, in field hockey out here. Right. And uh, it was because of the fact that it was away, you were only five minutes away right. from downtown, from the two schools. So, and those kind, of, those kind of relationships were really good in those days. So Bob, relationships, let's talk about family. So they've all been here. Oh yeah. So. From grandkids to your own kids. Yeah, um, I was very us a, fortunate. Tell us a couple stories about um, watching. I'm um, Brian. You know, works here. Known Brian. Brian and I were. I was a couple years ahead of Brian, but known him since college. Right. Um, soccer. Watching the the boys play play baseball. Is there a couple standout memories for you? Oh, it is. I was very fortunate to have three of my children, all three of my children played sports here at Bellarmine. My oldest daughter was a softball pitcher. Mm -hmm. um, my son was captain of the soccer team here his senior year. And Tim Chastanay, our current coach, was one of his teammates. Yes. Uh, and uh, my youngest daughter here was uh, got captain of the field hockey team her senior year here and is now the principal of Assumption High School. Uh, but I've seen that. I've had... Uh, Three grandsons play baseball here. Uh, one was a catcher, one was a pitcher, and one's a shortstop. They're all three different, but they're brothers. <laughs> and their father played soccer here, and he wanted them all to play soccer so badly when they were young, but they all loved baseball like their grandfather, me. And, yeah. <laughs> and I think that was the main thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really good. We've been very fortunate to have a lot of good athletes in all of our programs. It really has been, and I think that's been the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look back and see all the number of people who have been drafted into the professional ranks, both in baseball, like yourself. Right. I mean, here you played eight years in, in professional, eight or nine years in professional baseball and made it to, in fact, played with the Louisville Redbirds right out here. And your brother was also one. Uh, I taught Brian in class, <laughs> and I remember, but he was also signed to a baseball uh, uh, professional contract. But we've had numerous ones who have gone on. Todd Wellemeyer played, what, seven years in right. major leagues with the Cubs and the Cardinals and the Royals and, uh, and the like. And so there's all kinds of possibilities down the road that we began to see. And people take real note. And right. uh, I think that's been really interesting. And I think that the key going back to and we talked a little bit about the, the impact and how the experience here, but they are challenged academically, socially, oh, and athletically yeah. in that order. They truly are student athletes. They are definitely they're, student athletes. And um, they're not athletic students. That's no. that's how they're treated here. They It's it's real. They go to class. And that right. that's part of our, our recruiting spiel. Yeah, to, to, and that really is. It very yeah. much so. And I think that's something that everybody that comes here and signs a grant and aid that plays athletics realizes that they're a student first, they're an athlete second, and they're going to end up with a degree here. Our graduation rate is just phenomenal compared to most colleges uh, because at one time uh, back in 1976 I went back and just looked the first seven, 25 years of Bellarmine's history and we had graduated 98% of all basketball players and that's amazing um, that went through that particular aspect that uh, they, if they went four years and played four years of basketball, 98% of them went graduated. And that's that's a, a tribute to people like Joe Ravel, to people to uh, Alex Groza, and to many of the coaches who were here during that time because they followed in that type of stare, making sure that everybody was going to be a good student. So, And Bob, certainly Scott has done that too, and everybody. Earlier you said something about Bellarmine just being too small as perceived yeah, by some other. Yeah, that was other. perceived. So... That perception, I think, if you look back at the number of national championships that we have hosted, going back to basketball elite eights, right through the Division Two Championships Festival, oh, yeah. I mean that 
That's a lot of work. It's a lot of, unbelievable what we've done here and everything that we've seen. And it's not just in basketball. We've done seen the, I mean, twice we've come with, been in the game, the final game to get to the College World Series. I mean, and that's hard to do mm-hmm. in baseball because in and, and the like. But we've been there. We've hosted NCAA championships here uh, in tournament games, not only just in Knights Hall, but in our athletic fields outside in our stadium and whatnot. We've we've grown. People who know who we are now, mm-hmm. they I, definitely do. I agree. I think that has really uh, helped put Bellarmine Athletics right. on on a not just a, a regional map but a national map in the NCAA's eyes and in putting on those championships that we've, we've been afforded those opportunities from 2010 on, I think helped us in this transition. Right. If you can host six national championships in one week, we can put on a, a division one competition. Oh, can do I'm, it. I'm, I'm and we do confident. it the first, uh, we've done everything first class. We've done it every way, shape or form. And I think that's the main thing. We've yeah. really, really have done a great job on that. So, Bob, what else we want to cover here as we uh, I've kind of went through everything you and I listed. Anything else you want to touch on? Um, uh, let me see if, if I hope I don't want to I, I don't want to leave out any sport. I think all the sports are very, very important to deal with. Um, I mean, we've had sports in here that maybe not do to get the notoriety that have done very well. But one sport I want to mention is kind of interesting because we had men's tennis. Johnny Evans went four years as the KIAC champion. Chuck Roof went four years here in the GLVC and never lost a GLVC game in four years. Mm -hmm. Now, people don't know that, but that's amazing when you start looking out and realize, why didn't we see that beforehand, you know? I mean, those kind of things. Uh, I've learned a lot of things about different people that have come up and uh, but there's so many of them out there, and we're going to miss so many of them. But those come came out to me when I was doing this research. I went, holy, I didn't know that. Oh, I in, had no idea. And of recent, our women's tennis program, their oh, win yeah. percentage has been through the roof, making runs at the NCAA tournament. Oh. The last three years, our, our volleyball team has had 20 wins plus. Plus. Making, making the tournament runs. Yeah, you know, and they certainly have done great. And we've had a lot of great, great, great teams that over the years, slowly but surely in every sport. We had in 1969, we had a, our first golf team ever go to the NCAA was undefeated during the year. They never lost a match mm-hmm. in, uh, in 1969. And uh, they were, that was the Just Boys, you know, Elmore right, Just right. that started Persimmon and Ridge and everything else. They were here. There were mm-hmm. five of those that members of that particular team ended up being golf pros. I mean, that's I amazing. Incredible. And Coach Lally forever. Oh, yeah. Coach Lally was and here. Then, uh, you know, Skip Coach Welch. Stevenson Skip. ran the tennis pro here. He had ran our tennis programs. Right. I mean, those were fantastic. You know, people gave everything they had here. And, uh, and uh, so for all of our various sports, um, you know, Certainly, uh, all of the things that we look at from, uh, and uh, the fact is that I'm s- so pleased that our women's sports have been just as, have had so many successes as all the way as our men, and we've, and they've supported each other. That's the right. thing I've really liked is the right. support to see uh, of that particular issue. And I know when athletics reported to me, uh, that was my number one goal to get the men and support the women because they were still brand new and women to support the men. And that's something that has worked out fairly well. It really has, and then whether it be like sport, whether it be men and women soccer, supporting right. one another on the road, oh, yeah. which is which is key, or that uh, you know maybe there's opportunity to go out to Fraser Stadium and take in a Friday night soccer where oh, where would. all of our teams are out there. Yeah, and baseball and softball, sitting on the hill and oh, yeah. and being out there. Um, you know, our our men and women's cross country track, track teams have had incredible success. Oh yeah, with some very talented oh. runners. And a national champion. Oh yeah, in, in Yaya, you yeah. know, with the high jump. There's absolutely fantastic amount, and think of all of our cross country all Americans that we've run into with some of the women and and Chris Striegel and some of the ones that have been across here that yeah. in the division two we, we really came a long way. Right. And, a, and a great friend of mine and yours, Jim Vargo. Oh, a, Jim Vargo, a, a talented runner. Oh um, my gosh. Under Coach Weiss and Coach Weiss came back and helped Jim. Jimmy, yeah, that was right because Jim Gene was the, his coach and yeah. 
And uh, and then Jimmy Vargo became the Olympic Paralympic coach, you yes. know, for in the United States. That was amazing, you know, that he and did the, this. The change of some international recruiting in that sport for oh, him. Oh yes, and it the really successes did. that we've had there. So it's yeah. it's been quite a run. Oh, it has been. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I, I really have. I'm glad to see Bellerman on the way. I think it's going to be in the future. My last line when I wrote in this book, Scott, was something about we've had 67 years of success and the best is yet to come. I didn't know we were going to have Division I six months later after this was done. <laughs> the best is yet to come and you're right there putting it out there and let's do it and let's make it see it work uh, for everybody. This it, is fantastic. It's funny that you, you say that, Bob, because I've uh, when I recruit, coaches and staff to come work for us. And we talk about, you know, the laurels. We're not resting on, but but we're standing on shoulders. And I, the trick is, I, I've always told, especially our student athletes, that our best is in front of us. Oh, yes. So the same, same thing, it same is. message, different It is. Different I feel it's, there. and I, I get so excited every year when, I always, as a fa faculty member, I love the fall because it was the start of a new year. It was going to be exciting not only academically, but for me, but also the fact that I enjoyed always watching the athletic programs. And I've been very fortunate to have both children and grandchildren play sports here at Bellarmine. And I mm -hmm. love watching them play and watching my students play. Yeah. And I never, I've made sure that as a faculty member that I went to every, at least one game or one activity, even if it was a, uh, you know, it was music recital or an art show and I had a student in there, I wanted to go, I wanted to support students. And that's when I found here the faculty are very, very much yes. a strong supporter of activities that go mm -hmm. on here in every way, shape, or form. Yeah, well, you said it, Bob. Um, you know, you're a Hall of Famer. Uh, you're in the legend category, and that's intentional. Yeah. And we appreciate you. Okay, well, I, we certainly appreciate all the work you've done in getting us into where we're going now in Division One, and I look forward to it. And homecoming this year is a little different, but... We're here. That was the most important. We're here. Thing. We we are home as and, always, and we and, are home. Um, and we're we're thankful that uh, we can do this, uh, albeit virtually. And we've enjoyed our breakfast with Bob, and uh, look forward to some more wins for our Knights and uh, Knights Nation supporting us. Go Knights. Go Knights.